screenplay writer, writer Will Collins from, who's based in Ireland. And uh, we've been talking for a number of years now. And Will first appeared on Face World podcast, I believe in 2017, 2018. It's been a while. And yeah, um, yeah. so I'm, I have to have you back, Will, because I'm in love with the trilogy. I'm in love with The Secret of Kells, in love with Song of the Sea. Loved it so much that I started drawing the little characters, all the characters on my iPad. Um, oh, wow. With a stylus. And uh, most recently, what happened was I turned on Apple TV two days ago and I saw the uh, Wolf Walkers. And I remember from when we talked three years ago, you were already working yeah. on that. Um, yeah. And then immediately jumped out like, Oh my God, it's Friday. I got to watch this weekend. And I uh, <laughs> immediately start emailing you. And, and I was like, Oh, this is amazing. So welcome back. Uh, it's great to chat to you again. I remember that conversation it was a lovely, uh, we had a lovely chat because I thought it was lovely because when I, when I got off it, I thought, Oh, I sounded so stupid there. But then I listened to the finished interview and you've done a great job editing our mm -hmm. conversation down. You just got rid of all my ums and ahs and all that sort of stuff. So you did it. A fantastic job so uh yeah you make me look good so Aww. i'm glad to chat to you again you sounded so good and i we have to thank our, our producer her mom for doing such a phenomenal job um right. you know the one thing i'm gonna misquote you in just a second but the the things that you said it's like the painful truth that brings everything together for sound of the sea yeah 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 that was a big thing um one of my kind of early lessons in screenwriting, you know, um, I was very fortunate to kind of like come across this. I think everyone has their own concepts and how they make their own bread, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my concepts that I kind of like lean on a lot, it, one of them is you know, to, to for your characters to have a, a, a deep, painful truth that mm -hmm. the, 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 the journey that they are going to undergo will expose that and heal that essentially, you know. And um, mm -hmm. it kind of helped me through all of my stories and all of my films. Um, and yeah, it, it's Song of the Sea, definitely, and, and Wolf Walkers as well, yeah. Mm. And okay, let's talk about Wolf Walker. I feel like the moment we, I get into Song of the Sea, I have to, I told my mom, we're gonna, we're gonna have a movie night and we'll have to watch that. So uh, again, so Wolf Walker, the story is amazing. For those of you who are watching this conversation, I will be sure to let you know at which point we're going to give away some of the plots and, um, you know, things, bits you haven't seen, but I highly recommend it. Uh, I also want to let people know that to me, someone in my 30s right now, uh, in my mid 30s, it feels so special. It brings back to my childhood, as strange as it sounds, because I grew up in mainland China, and yet I'm watching I'm watching this Irish kind of um, folk tale, uh, very different types of animation. Uh, I just love the hand drawn effect. I love how raw everything is. It reminds me, it just literally brings me back to the childhood, yet the story is so sophisticated and captivating that I'm mm -hmm. utterly satisfied but for someone my age. And I showed it to my friends, two kids yesterday, six and seven years old, and they were just as engaged as well, as well as my mom in her late 60s. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I suppose maybe the, the maybe we're, oh, that's really a testament to the, the ethics and the principles of the studio cartoon saloon. Um, they, you know, the directors of this, Tom, uh, Tom Moore and Ross Stewart, they were actually, they're both from Kenya and Ireland and they actually grew up together. They were in school there and um, they used to do drawing competitions and what. Um, and uh, a group of them went to uh, an after school kind of youth group called the Irish Filmmakers. And from there, they were making Sharpies, but they had a deep passion for art and animation. They studied animation college together in Ballyfermot, which actually was the old, th that building was originally housed the Don Bluth studio, mm. who made uh, Dogs Go to Heaven, uh, American Tale, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were made in, in Dublin, Ireland. I'm sure mm. the, the original series, I'm sure people didn't know that. Um, so they uh, we're, were around the same age as well. So they kind of very much came, uh, with Tom started the company then with Paul Young and Nora Toomey were also in the college with them. And they came up with a kind of a, a kind of a, an idea that they were going to do their own 2D animated stuff. Even though at the time, uh, Hollywood was veering away from 2D animation. Disney was kind of on its last few 2D animated films mm -hmm. at the golden age of the 90s. It ended, you know, for the, the Lion King was a big, huge success and they had a, a great run of 
uh, sort of 2D animated films, but once Toy Story came along, that changed everything. And then really when DreamWorks came out with Shrek, it just totally, like, poor 2D was, you know, on the ropes. But despite mm-hmm. that, the, the gang of cartoons, Lou and Tom and uh, the other producers, they endeavored to make their own, you know, film. And they did series and commercial work to keep themselves going. Um, and so all their stuff has really been kind of 2D. But CG has been used and is used in Song of the Sea and CG is used in, in, um, in Wolfwalkers um, and Alux in very, in, in a nice kind of like synergistic way. Um, but then the actual storytelling side of it, I suppose, so see our influences were obviously hugely influenced by you know, stuff from, from, from the East, like Studio Ghibli, and, um, but we're also seriously influenced by the classical Western storytelling because we both died of that. And I think, for me, anyway, like um, Wolf is our attempt to really tell a very, very classical, westernized, like you know, hero's journey story, um, but using the absolute every possible tool they could in the realm of animation to to tell that story in the, the most visually and striking way that they could. So uh, you know, delighted to hear the work mm. for you. Yeah, I actually, I, I just felt like as a creative entrepreneur, um, a lot of people who are listening to the show are a, you know, a form or a type of um, creative entrepreneur, whether they could be, they could be a, a poet, they could be writer, um, filmmaker, designer, or, you know, uh, coaches. And, and so to us, you know, every day, especially in the year 2020, we're taking a lot of risks. And for me to witness a 2D animation in the year 2020, I find myself kept repeating that, articulating that to my mom, who's an artist, to my friends to say, it is so special on the surface. Like, you know, Cartoon Saloon is taking almost a risk of picking an identity that is so different than what we're used to these days. Everything is 3D, everything's super flashy. Um, And also I find that American animators have their own unique way of telling a story, right? Like at the beginning, there's something really dramatic happens like you need that hook um but something about the way that you wrote the story as well with the dialogues it's just something really subtle that i find at the same time also very captivating without being overly dramatic or sensational so um i don't know how you're able to achieve that like what what kind of mindset or how did you condition yourself to write for something like this Oh, um, well, that's a, it's a big question. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, if you're talking about the, the character and character arc and whatnot, um, really for me, you know, I, I, I try and make the, the characters as believable for my, to myself mm-hmm. as I possibly can. I try and empathize with every character on screen in some way. I try and, like, you know, you have to, because for me, I'm the person who really... I'm starting with the blank page. There's nothing on the blank page. And my job is to imagine the, the, the first, you know, do, do the first imagining of the movie, of the potential movie and bring life to the screen, bring life onto the page and just like on text. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But what I do is I suppose I, I, I yeah, I, th- that's it. I, I kind of draw from, you know, personal experiences. I know that we're all humans and we all share the same emotions. We all have had the same, you know, feelings, but in different contexts that relate, you know, relate to our own lives. So I kind of pull on past experiences. Like, you know, I've obviously, I've never been a, a 17th century English girl in Kilkenny, you know, uh, you know, wearing the wool, wearing the wools, and I never will be, or, you know, um, or a wolf hunter or a, a, a Lord Protector trying to, you know, um, you know, uh, pacify and tame the, the Irish landscape but I try and find a way into those characters and um, I suppose it's just a, a, a process of making the characters believable making their motivation believable to myself mm-hmm. and um, and kind of understanding who they are at the core making them as a, a, as real as I possibly can you know and not be patronizing to them you know I think that's it for me. Yeah so you know I'm gonna ask a silly question because I've never really been writing for any movies or films, needless to say, animation. When you say you look at a blank screen, uh, what are you given assets or, or visual-wise to begin writing? Or do animations come after you write? Or do you have some sort of a characters and plot lines before you write? No, that's a, a, a you know, any question is a good question, especially if you don't know. It's a perfect question because, so when I start, how the, the genesis of how it all develops is, um, in this case, 
the, the directors Tom and Ross they had the idea of setting their net of setting a film doing a film together that was you know set in uh, Ireland in the 1600s because there was a, a local legend about the you know the, the werewolves of Ossery they kind of thought it was a kind of a, a cool legend and also um, 1600s in Ireland was a you know a very turbulent and uh brought time for to be Irish you know we we uh, experienced uh, you know severe colonialism and the effects of um Robert Co- or, uh, Oliver Cromwell's um you know a rule here so what happens is they they put together kind of an idea they say okay right we're going to set a story here and we it's going to do deal with werewolves or this werewolf myth about people who can you know ch- you know basically uh not shape shift but you know you're, there's their wolf spirits can leave their bodies when they sleep um and they kind of had an idea of maybe this could happen so it was like a one page idea of what they could do and then i we they brought me on board very early on this was even before song of the sea was finished and we just sit around a table and we start talking about what t- talking about what the story could be how the plot would work and we between the three of us we hash out the plot we share a document and we literally start hashing out like you know what this what this what the plot possibly could be um, and come up with a uh, an outline of the story which would be a few pages long and once we're kind of happy with that then i just sit down and uh, open up a blank screen and um, not final draft but fade in document i was using and just start writing the, writing the script writing the actual screenplay just slowly kind of get okay what's the first shot you know what's what who's what's <laughs> going to happen how is this actually going to play oh on God. screen so in my head i'm literally imagining uh, really so what what the guys have done then is they they will in 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 concert with before even maybe when i was started they had started to create concept art of the world they had already started to kind of like create the visual language of how the city might look and what the you know the character design so i had an idea of what the characters would look like what this what the city would look like and what the, the woods would look like and they were you know just gradually they they shared a little office down in their in the studio and every time i would go down for a story meeting there would just be more and more pictures on the walls like you know and um so every time i went there it was great for a visual reference because i went okay I, I i know how vivid this place is going to be i know what the city might look like so mm-hmm. then so what i'm thinking about when i'm writing the screenplay i'm thinking about okay what's going to be on what are people going to see right now what's the action and what mm-hmm. what are the characters going to say what's going to happen so i kind of like i write uh, you know i i write a version i uh, of the film in my head you know and i just lay that out on 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 the page kind of like um you know what happens and what the characters say and the whole you should be able to just read the story from beginning to end in beginning, beginning to end and have the whole story of the film being told to you through the through the screenplay mm-hmm. and that's kind of my job and and will you've been doing this for a long time I maybe mean, even just for these three trilogy that we're talking about you know like yeah a decade yeah. or something well, yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't uh, write the first movie. I didn't write uh, the Secret of Kells, but I came on board for Song of the Sea. And the guys that start Tom had started on Secret of Kells back in two thousand. I, I might be right in saying two thousand. That came out in two thousand and ten, mm-hmm. and I I think it was two thousand and ten. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. Well, I started on Song of the Sea in two thousand and eight, in about October, November two thousand eight. That came out in two thousand fourteen, so that was you know six years. I started on Wolfwalkers before Song of the Sea finished. That was two thousand thirteen, and mm-hmm. it came out this year, two thousand twenty. So seven years, six years, seven years. So the development and production life cycle of these are extremely long, and mm-hmm. um, but uh, it's it, you know ultimately it's worth it. Absolutely, and I just it just occurred to me that. For people who are watching or listening to this, and if you happen to be Chinese or of Asian descent, I feel like there's something very unique about um, the stories or the films by, um, you know, uh, Will and his team are just incredible to us because we grew up with so many tales. And unfortunately, so many of them are just no longer being told where the only ones you hear are Mulan. But in reality, there are just so many folk tales and I love them and I feel like there's part of my childhood that's kind of left me behind because not in the modern world like so little of these stories are being shared uh, or paid attention to I don't know how much of this being passed on to the next generation you know uh and something so mystical I felt like that I was living in it I thought like how cool would it be for these girls uh I don't know how old they're supposed to be 10 12 years old to to be able to that's about right yeah wow yeah 
So there, so it's just fascinating. I'm going to come back to like a writing question. I'm, I'm trying to work on my own book. I know working a book is very different than perhaps writing for film. And I'm also in very much into comedy. So I heard that there's a technique where there's almost like a requirement that every nine seconds, eight to nine seconds, there needs to be a joke, need to be a moment uh, so the audience can stay engaged. And I just thought to myself, like, how crazy that that amount of work must be it just seems so simple wow. um wow yeah i've ne i've never heard that rule and i'm glad i never heard that rule because <laughs> that would drive me insane i think honestly there's a lot of rules that are made uh, that are that are made up that you know are, are there to drive people insane mm -hmm. i think there's um an awful lot enough for me uh, you know the, the the longer i've gone in my career the more I realize there are the, 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 there are fewer and fewer rules, mm -hmm. and um, you you know it's it it really is you know it's all down to your kind of own instinctive storytelling, and I maybe maybe it's due to the fact that I've been doing it so long that my own instinctive storytelling has kind of become sharper and sharper. Um, but definitely, well, I can see in the beginning, I, I used to look at an awful lot of um storybooks and uh, um, books about story and screenplay writing and stuff like that. And I never really found them very much use uh, until I actually, I really started writing my own stuff. And the best lessons you get is from doing your own stuff and making your own mistakes and kind of coming up with your own formulas, your own, you know, rationale, your own kind of principles of like, okay, this is how I did it, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily will apply to anyone else. It's just, it worked for me, you know, this time and another time, and it might not work for you again, but I think, you know, no two, no two books are the same and no two screenplays are the same. No two writers are the same. You know, everyone's got their own mm -hmm. technique and everyone's got their own way of getting to the finish line. And I think that's the most important thing. I can already feel this is a soundbite I'm going to pull out for this episode. I get so excited when you say this because even recently, just for my email newsletter, I decided I'm going to write the way I write. I'm not going to copy any formulas. I'm not just going to talk about other people. I want to share my own journey, no matter how it makes my audience feel. If they don't like it, you know, maybe they're not the right audience for me. And that yeah. just that was a game changer. People start replying whenever they get an email, we dive into deeper conversations. So thank you so much for pointing that out because so often we'll like, we just feel like there's, we got to write for the New York times. We got to, we got to please certain the wall yeah. street journal. We got to, you know, collaborate with these people. But I, every time I look at your film, for example, I just knew it was going to be good because I know that nobody else will write like this. Nobody else will animate like this. This is not going to be a cookie cutter story that's been told before. Mm. That's a really good point. And like, and the, and the gas thing about our story is like our story in our film is uh, you can, you can predict all the beats of our story from the, from the beginning, but it's not about the beats of the story. It's about how you tell your story. I think that's more important is how a story is told to you versus, you know, the, cause you know, you can distill all stories down to, you know, the, the exact same points you can kind of, you just know there's beginning, middle and ends and, you know, and for me, I go into most films, go, I, I, I literally, I go into every film I watch with my screenwriter brain switched off. I, I, I am just there. And, and generally, all stories are generally the same. But as long as they're entertaining me, as long as they're engaging me, I don't care. I just don't care as long as I'm being told something that's, that's you know, moving me in some way or entertaining me or scaring me or whatever, or making me laugh. Mm -hmm. um, it's as soon as... I think as soon as basically something goes awry in the story, does my screenwriter brain start to kick in? And I and I it subconsciously kicks in, and it's more of a panic. It's a sense of panic of a fee, an internal kind of feeling of something's not right. Something's not. Right. I need to fix this. I was like, something's not right. Oh God, there's trouble. And it's weird. And as soon as that kind of like instinct kicks in when I'm watching something, I know that there's something about the story not working for me. But I'm not kind of like sitting there you know, computing the plot, but not there, you know, kind of, you know, you know, mapping it out in my brain. I'm just, I'm just, I just want to be entertained. And most people just want to be entertained, engaged with, and I suppose uh, uh, being, being spoken, be, be spoke to in a kind of a truthful way as well, you know, in a sincere way. Because mm -hmm. um, if you try and mimic, mimicry is fine, but if you try and mimic, you, you, you get seen, you're seen through very quickly. So mm -hmm. the only thing you can really lean into is your own kind of unique perspective, your own unique voice, 
um, that's what makes you, you and your stories, you know, different to everyone else's is you are, you are slightly different flavors and your little different characteristic quirks that you have. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's what I kind of lean on. Yeah, I, you know, you nailed something as you were talking. I realized that the reason why I love this so much is uh, I, I knew, obviously, it's an Irish story. I still haven't been to Ireland. And I know physically I've not been in those situations. I'm not a 1700 <laughs> uh, sort of, you've never been in the environment yet. You can easily swap out the the two characters for them to be two Chinese girls, to be two American mm. girls. And it still would be so relevant and captivating. Um, I, I didn't really send this question over ahead of time. Well, have you, did you happen to watch, there's a new animation on Netflix called Over the Moon. It's about, have, have you heard of that? I have, and I must watch it. My kids have watched it when I was trying to get some work done and I must watch that. Is it, is it good? Okay, here's the thing. I would love for okay. you to see it and tell me what went wrong. <laughs> so. Right, okay. To me, I mean, your your kids are very young. I know that, um, but even I, you know, invited my mom and my friends over to uh, to watch. I was so excited because the main character name is Fei Fei. I'm like, yes. Yeah. You know, Thirty years later, there's a character finally named after me. I post on social media and I watch it. In the beginning, like the first 15, 20 minutes were amazing, and okay. then there comes a point. A lot of people watching this may disagree with me. And I just completely lost interest. And I said to myself, I got to watch this because I have this thing about Asian characters and Disney movies. I feel responsible for yeah. you know, supporting the film. And I tried to restart that film eight different times. I just couldn't do it. Whereas uh, for the the Wolf Walker, like honestly, well, if, even if I didn't know you, uh, I would, there was absolutely no point in that movie I would ever step away. And even you just said that at the beginning, you know, you probably know what's going to happen. You know, maybe it will be a happy ending. No, there were many plot twists, which I will, again, I will remind people, like, I did not see how things were going to come together. I was very surprised, like three times. Oh, good. I'm glad. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, oh, was good. So please let me know what happened to the, I, I would love to know what actually happened to the film. Like it just... I don't know whether it was the animation, was the, the script. It just like, it just fell apart so quickly. And then you will know, oh. I think you know exactly which point I'm re referring to. I'm going to watch it. It's a, it's a, it's a small miracle. Like, you know, making films is a, an incredibly hard thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 you know, having gone through the process now, I, it, it's incredible to get anything made. So I'm, inc I'm very compassionate to anyone who tries and endeavors to do, to do something like that because it's it's hard it's so it's so hard and you don't know as well what you don't know as well what other i was very lucky in the case of, of song of the sea and cartoon saloon that i was working i was working with cartoon saloon who you know their creatives are leading the studio and i'm you know tom's di directed those films and he's a co-owner of the studio so when it comes to the development and the creative decisions we're very much kind of protectors we're very much you know you know it's it's very much creative led mm -hmm. so the decisions that are taken are really you know even though we, we we would have disagreed on many many things you know we would have you know had plenty of you know disagreements um but ultimately everyone was doing everyone's point or everyone's uh, I suppose uh, point of view was always for the betterment of the, the the ultimate story or the ultimate you know so I don't know what this, the development set of of over the moon was you, you, there's all these other factors that could have yeah. had an effect on us and um, I will watch it and um, I'm, I've I've heard nice things about it. I've heard that this is nice so you're the first person I've actually you know is referenced it, who kind of said oh it doesn't really work for me yeah I would love to. I know. I love to hear your feedback. You know how I felt was, which we've all been there. And I did my film. I think after our conversation, I ended up, ended up producing a documentary. And people say that the the only not the only the harder thing than uh, putting together a documentary is to find money for it. So for <laughs> me, <laughs> the, for yeah. me watching Over the Moon, it's like wow. This started. Let's just say, you know, hundred million whatever dollars involved. And then halfway through the film, I'm like. Did they run out of budget for this part or something? Wow. Like, oh, I, dear. I, I just felt that's how I felt. But please don't let it ruin it for your kids. They might have loved the film. It somehow just didn't come together for me. And I think 
not just I'm not just necessarily stumping on this film, but I've seen TV yeah. shows after the first episode, you're like, I'm done with this series. There is I'm not interested in finding out what happens. Yeah. Like after the pilot, there's no story left. Or season two often for many shows, it just fall flat and uh, sometimes yeah. they come back to season three sometimes they don't but i'm gonna like i'm gonna poke around and i will tell my my viewers right now if you haven't seen it you might want to turn off because i will come back definitely come back later because i'm gonna ask some of the plot related or conflicts related questions for me um so okay. thank you for that so so will you just mentioned that you may have either conflicts or disagreements with uh with your team members everybody's there for the best of the movie but what are some mm -hmm. of the plots would you do you still remember that you thought where you wanted to go one way but were argue that they should go some other way like <laughs> oh plot point wise that's funny yeah. oh you mean regarding the development of the story i'm just trying to think what um where like I think our I think our disagreements were very trivial. Like I ultimately think they were very. I think ultimately we we're all pulling the same direction. But there might have been like instances where we say, you know, if I can't, I honestly I'm finding it hard to, to specifically it's only been recall one. <laughs> it's been seven years. I've had two, we've had two kids, and so my I've got like you know I've got a Swiss cheese brain right now. So there's like big black <laughs> gaps there. But I know like. But it would, it would happen in every, you know, when you're having a creative discussion, you know, it, it, because the very nature of having a creative discussion, you're throwing stuff out there and then someone, but but most of the stuff I would throw out there would be rubbish, you know, really like bad ideas. And that's like the the very essence of, you know, being creative. You kind of have to be in a kind of a mindset where you have to be able to just like throw all of the ideas out there. Because if mm -hmm. I, if, if you're, if you're in a kind of a, you know, a, a closed mind uh, state of thinking, then you really aren't going to get to that kind of place where the real good idea is. So you have to feel free enough to be able to to let the silly ideas out there. And I, I I can I can only point to myself. And I'm, let me think what bad ideas that I have. Um, oh, I know I had bad ideas all the time, but it's it, you, but like you know, but we're in a, a good enough state where we're we let's say a decent enough relationship. Where we would be able to just say, "No, nah, that's silly," you know, or you know, that won't work, or or that's a great idea. But yeah, if someone had a great idea, it was a great idea, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we have plenty of like. I think I can. If you're talking about specific plot points, I can tell you one of the biggest changes that we made, which wasn't difficult. There was um, for the first couple of drafts, Robin was actually originally a boy. Mm -hmm. So the first few first few drafts of the story, Robin was originally a boy. And I remember my very first, the very first pages of the very first draft I wrote, uh, they were on the flight back from the world premiere of Song of the Sea in Toronto. And I'm usually, I usually hate writing in a room with other people. I feel really self-conscious and I just don't like it. I just need to be, I just need to be, you know, on my own, feel like no one's looking at me and uh, looking over my shoulder so I can just type badly. And um <laughs> And I, I knew that the people sitting around me on this flight, they weren't English speakers. So I knew they weren't going to be reading my, or I thought they didn't want to be reading my screen. So I said, look, they, and they were sleeping as well. It was a long flight. So I said, right, I'm going to, I need to start this script. So I started writing the first few pages and it was of this like really, I was, I was really into it. I was like going, this is going to be like a Western. It was going to, this is going to be like the opening to Once Upon a Time in the West. There's going to be no dialogue. It's going to be just all character movement. And it was going to be Robin and and his dad, Bill, and we're going to see them hunting a wolf. And it's going to be this like Samurai Jack type sequence. But we'll see through their actions, their relationship, but also the kind of like the, the failings in the relationship and whatnot. And in that opening sequence, um, Robin gets bitten by a wolf, you know, in that opening sequence. And the story kind of started really quick. Mm -hmm. Um and it was a class sequence. I was so proud of it. It's, it was, they always talk about like you know, your babies and it really was my baby. It was that opening sequence was my baby. I loved it. I loved writing it. And I, I, and I knew that whatever Kenneth Noon would do, they would just turn it into something incredible, you know? Um, but about two drafts in, we got a note. We got several notes. One was from my late friend Liam. One was from Nora, the co uh, she directed Breadwinner and co uh, also co-owner of Cartoon Saloon. And I maybe someone else, and they said, "What if Robin was a girl?" And it was one of the easiest notes to take, but also one of the hardest notes to execute, because 
you, you know, once once we heard, what a problem was a girl? All of a sudden, I kind of like, my brain just went through the entire story and it just went, oh yeah, that would make that so much more interesting. That would make the drama of the a father-daughter relationship in this time is far more compelling than a father-son relationship in this time. It's like, okay, because the father-son dynamic, you know, what, what we'd set up was that the son was supposed to inherit the kind of the role of the father. He was supposed to become the father. He was supposed to be a hunter. He was supposed to be a killer. But from if Robin was a girl, all of a sudden she should never be with him. Her destiny is to be in the scullery in the castle. And all she wants is to be with her dad. So all of a sudden it, it was a kind of a no-brainer note. It was just like, oh yeah, this feels great. And also it made my writing of the character of the friendship between uh, Maeve and Robin, because my first, I think my first two drafts, uh, uh, the relationship between Maeve and Robin didn't feel quite right. There was a, there was a, a strange dynamic, but once I made Robin a girl, it was just like the friendship was there. I just, it just could feel their, the, the, the vibrancy between them. No, it was an easy note to take, but the problem was, was that the entire film had to get changed just even though we held all the same plot points but we, everything had to be shaken and 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 stress tested to see okay how does how does this affect our story mm. and uh, and it really was a big big change it was this it was the smallest note what if robin was a girl <laughs> you know but as a result and it was the right note but it really took us it, it took us like it was like turning a big steam liner trying to get that thing shifted around we had to go slowly go through everything and kind of go okay does this make sense for the rest of the story and yes we saw it made sense for the rest of the story but mm -hmm. what ended up happening is it didn't make sense for that lovely opening that i'd written and the lovely opening that tom and ross had also fallen in love with oh. and we kind of held on to that hunting opening for as long as we could and I think I kind of gave up. I was kind of thinking, you know, earlier on, this is, I think we need to lose it. It's not, it doesn't make sense. And that opening just, we're trying to make it work, trying to hold on to it. But as we went draft after draft, that scene became more watered down and watered down and it just didn't make sense for the film. And ultimately we had to kill that baby and we lost that lovely opening scene. So there you go. I don't know if I answered your question, um, but uh, it's a very long way around it. I'm so glad Robin is a girl because, you know, I think especially as a woman watching this for the first time, it just reminded me of the dynamics between two very young girls, 10 to 12 years old, yet the storyline reminds me now as an, uh, uh, an adult woman that the intricacies and the sophistications um, between women's relationships that you go from childhood as best friends to getting into constant arguments and then you know at some point in your life either you're you know you find your partner you get married have kids and it just turn the relationships upside down again and you know and then you think about like sometimes that the among women what's sometimes unfortunate is there's always a bit of a, a competition that's i find really unnecessary and yet it's always present it's always present um okay. but you know, for, for women, like I see Robin and Maeve, like when they come together, they had arguments and I love how like just pouting and like, oh, you know, I'm just here waiting for you. You promise me you're going to show up. It's like such a typical girl yeah. fight. And then when yeah. they do come together, they're they're more powerful than anybody could ever imagine. It's magical. And I think about mm -hmm. the same thing for us women today like at a workplace or in our personal relationships, we could just leave all that junk, all that, you know, like yucky stuff out and just be us, be creative, like how powerful we could be. So that's kind of a message to me in a very yeah. almost selfish way. Yeah. Oh, that's cool to hear. That's very, that's, that's lovely to hear. It's, um, it's weird. Yeah. Like uh, I, 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 I was, I've often thought like, where, where did I pull to make kind of like relationship work? And I really do feel a kind of, I, I drew on my own childhood experience where one of my best friends growing up was um, a neighbor of ours, uh, uh, Shirley Crimmon. And sh Shirley was like, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying, but Shirley was like a, a bit of a tomboy, right? Yeah. But I, we had the best childhood together. We would go, Shirley, myself and my brother, we would just go on these amazing adventures out into the, uh, up and through the fields, as we call it, like getting stuck in bogs and getting stuck in mud and climbing trees and carving trees and all this sort of jazz. But I also remember the sense of, you know, hoping that Shirley, you, we were like one house away from each other, we can come out to our, our wall. And I remember going, I wonder if Shirley's going to come out today. You know, wait, I wonder if Shirley's come out to play, you know, and you're wait, waiting and waiting and going, 
oh, where are they? You know, you're going with you know, that frustration of like, oh, where are they? But yet I distinctly remember that sense of joy of sitting on a branch in a tree and just talking about telling each other the plots of films we've seen or just mm -hmm. talking about going on adventures together. And it was a very, very um, warm and sincere uh, friendship. And, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, informed, you know, the, 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 the writing of their Robin and Maeve's relationship mm -hmm. for me anyway. And maybe like infused with Maeve's infused with a little bit of a kind of like boldness. Boldness, we use that in Ireland as a kind of a, a roguishness or a, a, um, she's she's from the other side of the track. So she doesn't have the same social rules as 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 Robin has. And, um, I'm so glad. But also I have to credit the animators as well. The animators did an amazing job of and, and the girls, the, 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 the performers, the animators did an amazing job of finding little subtle characterizations like that I didn't write in the screenplay at all, but like they, they got the performance. So animators are like are half of, or more than half of the performance and they don't get the credit that they deserve, but they would find those moments. Like there's a moment where they're sitting on a branch and Robin is brushing Maeve's hair. Yeah. I didn't write that. The and animator, the, the, <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't write any of that stuff. It's just just brilliant. That's what you get when you when you work with really talented people. Now, maybe Tom had it, or maybe storyboard artist had it, or I don't know who had that idea. But it's those little decisions, those little nuances, yeah. give the characters more depth and life and um, reality. And also on top of that, it's the casting of the actors. Mm -hmm. Like um, the the it was um, Honor Nevesy is the, the the young actor who plays Robin. And me, uh, Eva Whitaker plays Maeve, and I'm not. I'm not lying. Where I was in the room we're, when we were doing the voice recordings, they nailed every take on the. They gave us the perfect line reading on the first take every time. Now Eva, I don't know what age Eva was when she did it, but like, there's one emotional line reading that, and it kind of always choked me up when I was writing it. When 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 the character um, Maeve kind of goes after she's made friends at Rome, she goes back to her mammy. And her mammy's asleep and then she's telling her mammy all about this great friend she's met and then she kind of just it just slides into her being really worried about the man her mammy saying mammy like where are you i'm worried about you and i always kind of i i, I thought it might work when i wrote it and um, but then i heard eva like her first line reading of it we were there was myself tom and ross and cairn and um the three of us were all welling up like she just nailed it on the first go so it's really it's kind of a synergy of like all good creative talent working together oh, and to create the, all this thing. You know? So um, again, I've hijacked your question. I've answered it. This is great. I was wondering that the voiceover actresses, I, I, I can never tell their age because they truly sound like 10 to 12 years old, you know, with that. Yeah. Are they young women? Are they? You know? I, no, I'm trying. I, I'm going to, I'm going to miss, I'm going to, I'm going to miss age them. Like I would guess that I, um, uh, Honor, who played Robin, she must have been, was she 14? And then uh -huh. Eva might have been 10, maybe nine or 10. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, oh she was, she's very young. Yeah, she was very young, like, you know, no, they might, they might, they might say, no, I was actually 22, but um, no, they were quite young. <laughs> yeah. How is that possible for young kids, nine, 10 years old? You're just in fourth fifth grade to in internalize the sophistication of these like emotions and the scripts are non-trivial i mean these dialects are non-trivial how do they memorize and do that oh well no in this they didn't have to memorize but they had they had the the, the script open in front of them but they had their work done when they came in they yeah. came in fully prepared like oh, wow. they, they they honestly I remember, I just, I just remember because, because the role of Maeve is a much more emotional role and there's a lot more like rage and happiness and laughter and joy. Yeah. She, like, she just got every emotion on the first take. She knew she was so well prepared coming, coming, coming to the, the lectern and in front of being in front of the microphone. She just had it. And I, 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 I'm the wrong person to actually to comment on it because I, I don't know her process. And it was, it's a bit of a magic and a mystery to me as well. Just like Sean Bean doing Sean Bean and Simon McBurney who played Lord the Lord Protector. I just sat there and just went, oh, wow. I could never do that. Oh, I don't know how they do it, but it's just, it was just, it was just like, it was, yeah, it's, it's lovely seeing the magic of life performance in front of you, hearing yeah. your characters come alive. You know, these, that's why actors are, you know, it's so vital, you know, you know, again, it's that texture and 
um, like real life that they, they they breathe life into these characters. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah, they they actually they actually do. That is so fascinating. So, I mean, I here are some of the the plot questions I had. Mm -hmm. So, is it with Robin being this young girl and she fell asleep and you could tell she just naturally had a heart of just this kind heart. And so I thought this young human girl is going to rescue the wolves and make friends as a human girl. And then of course she fell asleep and then you see this wolf figure and spirit comes out of her. I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on. She's one of them. Is she one of them? Is yeah. she dreaming about this and you know where, where she has some sort of superpower to be able to relate and connect so was the intention yeah. that she is she is one of them she is a wolf walker herself oh yeah well we were playing on the the, 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 the there's the werewolf myth there's a kind of the, the the u.s version of the werewolf myth is like you know you get bitten by a by a werewolf and you now are the werewolf and uh, so there's that there's that thing and um, but then so we kind of we, we we leaned into that and we just kind of said well look what you you get bit, you if you get bitten you become a wolf walker you know sh you know i can walk in their shoes you literally will walk in the shoes of a wolf you are you know um you're one of them so yeah she literally becomes one of their people and the same thing happens with you know bill the dad later on when he's um trying to put the the big big wolf back in the cage on the stage and it's all very dramatic and emotional and when he goes to kind of like ch um, put chains basically on young Maeve the, yeah. the big wolf bites Bill and that's the moment he gets infected you know or he's not infected but he's you know now gotten the wolf walker bu bug as well essentially oh. um, yeah so that's what yeah, that's kind of how, that's the logic of how we, we, we try to make it work, you know, um, just leaning into kind of like the age old. Now, every culture, there's in so many cultures, they have their own version of the werewolf myth. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, the werewolf myth in Ireland is, it come, well, I don't know if it's, it, it, I actually wasn't familiar with it. It's a very localized one, uh, uh, you know, that's that inspired wolf walkers. Um, it was about the wolves in Ossery and they're about basically people who, walk as people but when they sleep they they become wolves and whatnot they were shapeshifters mm -hmm. and a part of i suppose it'll be interesting for you to know um a part of the the backstory of the inspiration for the story was when oliver cromwell the law protector the real life law protector oliver cromwell came to kind of um tame the land and colonize colonize ireland back in his campaign in 1650 a lot of the most Irish people kind of went along with it and just kind of went, well, you know, he came with this very powerful army and he kind of said, well, if you can, if you can, you know, play ball, you can have a bit of land and, you know, we'll, 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 we'll keep you, we, we won't kill you. Um, but anyone who resisted or, you know, were, were, were dealt with swiftly. So a lot of people, a lot of Irish people like fled into the woods and, and also we had a, a, quite a large wolf population that worked in a kind of that lived in in some bit of natural um, kind of balance with the, the native population as well because there was enough there was enough woodland for them to to hunt and um, to to get their own feed. But when Cromwell came over, he wanted to agriculturalize the land, so he, that meant cutting into the woods, which is literally what's happening in the movie, like you know, and that's mm -hmm. what was happening in real life. But when you're cutting into the woods, woods you're cutting into the into the wolves, you know food supply as well so it created a, 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 an issue so that's why Cromwell in real life brought over hunters to eradicate the wolves but he used propaganda and this is kind of like one of the early examples of of real life propaganda he created these like wood print posters and in the wood print poster it depicted a wolf standing up on its hind legs like a man wearing man's clothing mm -hmm. uh, uh, human's clothing and it and it basically was a, a flyer for the hunters to say, "Listen, um, you go, we'll give you five shillings for the for the head of a wolf. But if you come across any Irish people, you know, we actually have evidence to prove that those Irish people are actually wolves as well. They're shapeshifters. So if you kill an Irish person, you're effectively killing a wolf, and we'll give you the same again, or we'll give you a double for this, and we'll give you such a price for a priest. So they were using the propaganda to to kind of like uh, to." validate a type of genocide really you know so um yeah so there you go another long <laughs> another meandering answer for um 
uh, a good question. This, you know, this is actually kind of, uh, you know, take us right to one of the, the questions I had written down. But right before that, I was going to say I had a moment of reflection as to why I got a little bit confused about. I just thought like, oh, my God, Robin and her dad are so special. They didn't know they're wolf walkers all along. I didn't realize it was as a result of Maeve scratching her while she was like upside down, swinging from the rope. And the reason was, I think in American movies like uh, Spider-Man, for example, they once you get bitten, they keep showing the wound. The wound will light up, like keep referring back to it. You're like, oh, something is happening. But I think it was yeah. so, such a light touch that yeah. I actually love that. Because I didn't even, I was like, oh yeah, you got scratched. Like I didn't even think about it. But yeah. this is this is one of those Reddit conversations because people are like, "Oh, this could happen." And it was because of that. And like, you know. It, oh, it, we we de we definitely try to. I'm I'm. That's kind of nice because we we try to deal with it subtly and not too obviously. Because when May when she bites her, mm. Maeve brings her back home, and Maeve's like, "I gotta heal you," and Maeve yeah. is trying to reverse any effects, and she's like, "Going, okay, you're healed. Good luck. Get out the door. I'm. You're done." Um, mm -hmm. and even her mom kind of brings it up. Uh, when uh, Robin as a wolf faces uh, meets her mom in the cage you know in the big crumb in the in the lord protectors kind of chamber the 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 mother wolf says only a only a wolf walker can create another only a wolf walker's bite can you know um make another become a wolf walker she says it very quickly you see you oh. wouldn't have picked it up because we i remember that actually that line reading was something that was we did a little bit of tweaking of that line reading when we recorded it and um, Maria, the actress, um, the actor, she had uh, she had a lovely little note on that, and we just kind of did a little kind of rewrite on it. And it came, it, she reads it so quickly and urgently because her motivation is to make sure her daughter's okay. So yeah. it's it's kind of if you go back over it, you'll you'll see it. It's there. It's there. There's a little <laughs> shimmering on the wound in her her arm, and her arm kind of glows just before she kind of turns into wolf, or her wolf her wolf shape comes out. There, there it's definitely into that. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to watch it again, for sure. This is so fascinating. So going back to what you brought up, the whole time I was thinking, um, especially in the past 10 years, when it comes to, you know, animal rights movement, and especially on all the environmental issues, you turn on Netflix, you can't even avoid the fact that, you know, how our, our planet has come to be and what we really got to take actions right now. So I wonder if it was intentional to, uh, like, address or touch upon sort of animal rights or like the, the bigger environmental issues as part of the film was that part of the plot as well and what your personal thoughts are on that oh absolutely and, and that's that's like stemming from the directors tom and ross they're they are they're both vegan and they're both huge um passionate environmentalists and um animal rights activists and they you know they, they, what we're looking for you know we i suppose the very nature of the plot kind of falls into that, falls into this uh, idea that man is over uh, over industrializing the his agriculture, over industrializing his farming, and basically upsetting the ecological balance of the, 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 the land that we live in. So it absolutely is one of the central ideas and one of the central themes of, of the film that kind of like, that, that how, how uh, you know, man's kind of like, development has really tipped the balance uh, and uh, you know in, in, against our own favor against ourselves like you know we're messing it up for ourselves not just nature it's not like us versus them it's like we're all in the same we're all in the same ball hurtling around the solar system and mm -hmm. um as a result we're kind of like we're really we're really messing it up and yeah it was from the get-go it was always a it, it wasn't even a big it wasn't even something that we talked about that much because mm -hmm. we we're always talking about story we just all knew it it was just like inherent in what we were, we were we were trying to to say, you know. Mm -hmm. mm, this is lovely. I'm so glad I asked that question. So to respect your time, well, I we have a couple of minutes left. The the one and for people who are watching this, enjoying this, I'll be sure to include a link to our previous conversation as well, where I ask Will a, a lot about kind of the creative process, how Will became a writer in the first place, also working the film Song of the Sea, which I'm absolutely in love with, and you can watch for free on. On Netflix and this one on Apple Plus. So um, the the one last question, I guess, from me is: This past year, 2020, has been particularly challenging for creative entrepreneurs. And um, some people have done really well. A lot of people have suffered. And and so was wondering, what was your 
personal experience been like? Where do you find your inspirations, you know, given their moments of lockdown and, and things like that? So how has that changed your life as a writer in 2020? Oh, yeah, it may, it, it's made me appreciate long days, uninterrupted days that I used to have before the pandemic happened. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's a it, very difficult. It was very difficult because we have two, uh, two kids. My wife was also working full time. So and and her work became when the pandemic pandemic hit, it directly affected her work in a you know and she became incredibly busy and she was indirectly in, involved with um, COVID and with the fallouts of COVID. So it was kind of an explosion in her work. So what ended up happening for me personally was I ended up taking over the duties of the kind of the childcare during the day, oh, which wow. made my so I had to sit work day uh, to either side of the the, the childcare day. So I would get up at like. I would set my alarm for 5.30 and endeavor to get up at that time every day, get a few hours in in the morning. And uh, when my wife kind of like then kind of started properly at work, uh, I would take over the childcare uh, and just burn them out for the morning, burn myself out <laughs> and make lunch and all that crack. And then after dinner, when my wife had finished, I'd go back and do a few hours. No, it was uh, by the end of every day, I was always exhausted. And every morning was just, it was exhausting. But how I how I managed this mentally was I actually just made I, I literally said baby steps and I said I'm going to do baby steps if I can get 15 minutes done at a time that's great and I would just try and say I'm going to get a couple hours done a day just a couple hours done a day and I would just I was always just kind of even if I could snatch 15 minutes in the middle of the day when they were watching a movie or watching something I would grab it and all those at the end of the day if I could kind of hit a, a bit of a quota. Uh, an, a, an actual time quota, I would be satisfied enough. No, it certainly slowed down my process greatly. Absolutely. And also the stress mm. of, of uh, you know, the existential stress we all faced and all the other things that happened, it affects your creative mindset. I'm not one of those people who can just block it out and just go, you know, oh, I'm, no, don't worry, I can just do it. Like, you know, I, I you know, if I'm stressed, I'll, I'll eat, you know, I'll emotionally eat and I'll get bogged down by it. But I would still try, you know, I think I tried to work on my mental health. I tried to, you know, the, the actual act of writing helped deal with it as well, kind of helped me kind of like deal with the the everyday um, chores uh, and all this stuff. So, but now that, but the great thing is that I learned that, you know, look, we're adaptable. We're an incredibly adaptable species. And, you know, a poor is, you know, woe is me, like, you know, I, you know, I, I had to do, child you know extra child care and all that sort of jazz but you know we got around us and they're back at school now but we're still not fully out of lockdown we still have that anxiety but I think that what I did is I just took the top wherever I could find any bit of time I would take it and I didn't measure myself on the number of pages I wrote or what I did I just measured myself on the physical amount of time I I sat down and I tried it's not about how successful I was I tried Mm -hmm. and I think that was the I kept things going slowly Mm -hmm. that way that's how I managed Mm, I love that. This this is uh, I, I, I honestly I always consider I don't have children. I really uh, consider myself liking children. I I do, and you know I I always have a great time with my friends' kids. And yesterday I had a two hour babysitting experience uh, with probably older kids than yours. They're six and seven years old, and I just re- remember that you know we had to entertain them and organize them the whole time they were here. I had no idea so. Uh, yesterday, everything on my to-do list was not checked off, maybe 20% late into the evening. And I, I, I got to yeah. say that my heart goes out to parents out there. I really had no idea what it was like to be a parent. And for me to babysit someone for just a few hours was really eye-opening. Uh, for me to think about, I complain about, oh, I, I got up at eight today I uh, instead of nine, or like I, I want to work into the evening. All oh, the freedom I have. I have in my life that I did not appreciate or even acknowledge. Yeah. I will say, you, you know, you know, I've been doing it now for a few years. So I've developed muscle memory of, okay, what's that going? You know, I can, you develop the muscle memory of how to deal with situations. So you were thrown into the deep end where you went, I have no idea how to deal with these two people or what do I do? So, you know, right. I've had years, years of experience. So, um, you know, as a big difference, you know, listen, True. if you, if I, if I, an extra couple of kids landed at my doorstep, that I didn't really, you know, deal with it on a daily basis. I would have been in the same situation of like going, 
who are you and what do you what do I need to do to pacify you or keep you entertained or what's what's your what's your deal like you know so I know my own kids yeah <laughs> I know my own You're kids right. You know? You're right absolutely it, it the truth is somewhere in between it's not as dramatic as I imagine it to be but I'm so so glad when it came out I thought about your family your kids everything we went through I'm like oh thank god this came out when your name okay. showed up on the screen I'm like yes well <laughs> that's fair you know I really so happy it's great. I think it kind of helped us, I, you know, in, in an odd way, in an odd uh, kind of weird way. I think the pandemic has helped Wolfwalkers because my 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 feeling is, well, obviously, all of the big blockbuster Hollywood movies, you know, were just ripped away from everyone and it's just putting it, putting into put into the drawer until next year. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of feel what's happened with Wolfwalkers is, is as a result those types of stories are big spectacle classical adventure stories and mm -hmm. audiences have been kind of deprived of that story this year so mm -hmm. wolf walkers really even though it's a, a relatively small budget film it really is a big epic kind of classical <laughs> adventure story and i kind of think we've kind of we're coming out of, we're coming out at a time where audiences are yeah they're getting the small low budget independent movies but they're kind of not getting that kind of like entertaining like you know cinema popcorn munching movie you know kind of like those classical kind of like adventure stories and we're kind of satisfying that appetite that's mm -hmm. there so the timing of it kind has worked in our favor i feel you know mm -hmm. so um that's the one bone the one benefit out of pandemic times for sure and for people in your 30s 40s and 50s it's so nostalgic to get back into that like that just 2d it, it just so beautiful everything's so beautiful like, drawn and i told my mom i even uh, bought the album for song of the sea she's like what when was the last time for you to purchase any like mp3s and i actually did went to amazon and bought wow. the soundtrack <laughs> cool that's great to see. yeah so this is so wonderful will i feel like i can talk to you forever and uh we should do this again for sure thanks um, babe. that was lovely yeah yeah for sure okay i'm gonna take us offline hi everyone leave your comments and uh, we'll be very happy to answer questions uh after the show as well so thank you so much for being here Yay. thank you it was great thanks babe. thank you